And the basic idea is that public health has been militarized and the military has been sort of turned into a public health front or um, Potemkin village, such that they are using public health language and public health laws to actually carry out a military campaign. And I would not call them DOD vaccines, I would call them DOD weapons. So I call it the kill box because the first sort of lead that I had was Todd Callender's January 30th, 2022 interview on Elizabeth Leavleet's podcast called Truth for Health. And he described it as a kill box. And then I looked that up and it turns out it's a military term for establishing a geographic space or three-dimensional area for a military attack by air and by surface to kill the people who are in it and then dismantle the kind of um, framework and move on to the next campaign. And what the DOD and the World Health Organization intend to do and have gotten quite far in doing, but not completely um, reach their goals is to set up the entire world as their geographic terrain, their target population as all the people in the world, the duration of their campaign as permanent, and the weapons that they're using are, number one, informational, that's the propaganda piece and the censorship piece. Number two, psychological, that's the fear and terrorism piece of telling people they need to be afraid all the time and they need to listen to the government. And then the third piece is the chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons, which are called in their campaign pharmaceuticals, vaccines, but are actually toxins and pathogens. Um, so I started, after I heard that interview, I had already been wondering what was going on, but I started trying to um, track down some of the things Todd Callender talked about in his interview and figure out what the legal frameworks were and how they were set up and what the financial coercion mechanisms were. My finding, which many other people have found in various from various other angles, was that this project has been going on for centuries. Um, it's basically globalist central bankers and lots of related organizations trying to get complete control of human beings um, through banking programs and through military programs. And they kicked it into higher gear in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act. And then they kicked the public health aspect of it into higher gear starting in the 1930s and 40s. Um, before the um, 1960s, they mostly did it through orchestrated armed conflicts and financial depressions and wars, which are very loud and messy and destructive to infrastructure. And it makes it difficult for them to have plausible deniability and legal impunity for what they're doing. So in the mid 60s, they got much better at inducing suicide and homicide by fraudulently labeling poisons as medicines or as vaccines or as prophylactics and telling people that submitting to that poisoning process was their civic duty. And that's, we saw that in COVID with the, the shorthand for do this or you're um, going to kill your grandma. Um, and the way that the pharmaceutical method is primarily useful to them is that plausible deniability is much easier and legal impunity is a lot easier. They can achieve the same goal of killing lots of people without their fingerprints being all over it. Um, I looked into the coercion cascades, mostly financial. Um, not going to go into a lot of detail with that, but it starts at the top with the Bank for International Settlements. And they can use their control of other federal central banks' access to financial systems, and then all the way down through state governments, national governments, local, municipal, school districts, hospitals, everything. If you comply with what they're telling you to do, as far as masking and testing, isolating yourself, taking injections, then you will get the financial access that you need to run your business or to have a job. And if you don't comply, they can cut you off from those services. And so that is one of the main mechanisms through which the whole thing was carried out. And then on the legal side, um, at my website, I do trace it back farther, but I'm going to start at 1969 just for the sake of starting somewhere. Um, the U.S. Congress passed the, a law to set up the Chemical and Biological Warfare Program. And in that law, which is 50 U.S.C. Chapter 32, there are very important key terms 
including protective, prophylactic, and defensive, which is how they justified doing it. They, they were using those words because the international community of ordinary, non-insane people um, were concerned about biological and chemical weapons, and they were working on international treaties to prohibit them. And so they needed to build in loopholes, and the loopholes they built in were, we're not going to do biological and chemical research and weapons development except for protective or prophylactic or defensive purposes. And that's a false characterization because all biologically active products are intrinsically aggressive and toxic and lethal. And that's where we get disciplines, or that's the thing that disciplines like toxicology, pharmacokinetics, genotoxicity, um, drug-drug interactions are all related to that fact that everything that goes into the human body or any living body has some effects which can be toxic. So that was the way they tried to get around that. And then the foundational public health emergencies platform uh, came out in 1983 when Congress passed the Public Health Service Act Amendment, and that set up the public health emergencies program under the 1944 law that had originally set up the public health service, which is a branch of the military. And it also, in 1983, Congress and Reagan set up a $30 million slush fund, and that has continued. It's got a different name now than it did then, but it's still being funded as recently as the, the NDAA and the Consolidated Appropriations Act in December 2022. The other thing they did in the 80s was set up the 1986 National Vaccine Program and National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. And that's the one that set up the liability exemptions for manufacturers and funneled anyone who was injured by a vaccine into this different compensation program. And that's been used as a model since the um, COVID started for the countermeasures injury compensation program. So the international piece, the cornerstone is the World Health Organization, which is not a health organization. It's a military organization because of this merger that I'm talking about. It's sort of the military arm of the, the one world government that they're trying to set up. And they did a set of amendments to the international health regulations in 2005 that entered into force in June 2007. But basically, the IHR, which are currently going through another round of amendments to make them worse, called on national governments to strengthen their own domestic laws and fund more programs for surveillance, testing, detention and quarantine, physical control, and forced treatment during international outbreaks of communicable diseases. And the pretext that they used, because it was bankers who were doing this, was that they needed to protect international trade from disruptions caused by disease outbreaks. But the real intent was to set up these legal systems that transfer sovereign government from the nation state to the World Health Organization and the BIS automatically when a public health emergency of international concern has been declared. And Congress and U.S. presidents and the cabinet complied with that demand from the World Health Organization. So two of the key years were 1997 and 98. That was when the beginnings of the emergency use authorization program was set up and when they transferred the CBRN weapons stockpile from DOD classification, I guess, to HHS or CDC classification and control. Um, it was the same products, as far as I can tell. It was just a relabeling and a rehoming of them. And the, yeah, the EUA that was kind of a two step thing. Uh, at the time, the public was really upset about the use of unapproved vaccines for anthrax on military troops and the horrible adverse effects they were having. Um, so Congress passed a law in November to so kind of revoke authorization for testing or using unapproved products on military troops. But three days later, in a different law, made it so that the same programs could be done, but the target population would be expanded from just military troops to the entire American population. Then... Around 2000 to 2002, using the momentum from 9-11 and the anthrax attacks on Congress, they set up, through the statutes again, um, program management sort of structures. Um, they did that through the 2000 
Public Health Threats and Emergencies Act through the 2001 Authorization for Use of Military Force. And people talked about this at the time. It was construed as putting the country into a permanent state of war, the global war on terror, with every other country in the world. So there was no geographic limitation. There was no time limitation. There was no identified enemy other than terror. And through that, I think other people figured this out at the time, and then it sort of got suppressed. But um, it made everyone in the world into a presumptive combatant or enemy target. So it was essentially a de facto covert global martial law act by the U.S. government. And then in those early 2000s, we also got the Patriot Act, the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act, and the Homeland Security Act. And those were just more of the merging of the DHS, the DOJ, the HHS, the Department of Defense, all of the cabinet agencies. So since then, 2003 to 2009, there have been lots and lots of executive orders on these things, lots more statutes and appropriations, lots of agency regulations, um, guidance reports that were circulated to state, local, and tribal authorities and law enforcement so that they would know that under a public health emergency, they are subordinated to the federal military. FDA issued a lot of guidance for industry documents and sent those out to the pharmaceuticals and to the academic organizations and NGOs to let them know about how FDA was going to handle experimental products like vaccines, gene therapies, biologics. And they did more test runs like 2003 SARS, 2006 MERS and 2009 H1N1. That brings us up to the other transactions authority. And this was revealed through Pfizer's um, April 2022 motion to dismiss uh, whistleblower Brooke Jackson's False Claims Act case. They said this was not a vaccine. It was a DOD prototype. And we were never obligated to do valid clinical trials. We were never obligated to prove safety or efficacy to anyone. We never had to get FDA authorization through any of the normal guidance for industry channels because it was a prototype. On October 4th, 2022, the U.S. government endorsed that view and filed a statement of interest and support for the motion to dismiss, basically saying that clinical trials were never material or necessary for DOD to pay the contractors for producing and distributing the bioweapons known as COVID-19 vaccines. And so the, all of this became visible from 2020 to the present when the uh, World Health Organization Secretary General issued the Public Health Emergency of International Concern at the end of January 2020. And the HHS Secretary immediately triggered the domestic frameworks through the determination that a public health emergency exists, followed by PREP Act declarations for medical countermeasures, which are the weapons. And then Congress and the presidents, Trump and Biden, passed several additional congressional acts, um, funding and um, reinforcing the structure of the kill box and issued more executive orders under the Defense Production Act, under the Stafford Act, under the National Emergencies Act to sort of build out the program. Basically what it built is a huge public and private funding stream for military-led um, bioweapons research and use, eliminated informed consent um, by reclassifying people who could potentially be carrying a disease as presumptive national security threats um, so that you can do anything you want to them because you're on a war footing. And to shield the products and weapons from product liability, to shield all the people involved from criminal liability and civil liability, and to shield the government funders, developers, and regulators from criminal prosecution under the other laws, which are in place, but are sort of superseded by this, this framework for use of bioweapons, use of chemical weapons, terrorism, things like that. I see it as a joint project between the U.S. Department of Defense, a coordinating committee of that, the Federal Reserve, and the World Health Organization and the Bank for International Settlements. And the United Nations, but the World Health Organization is like a, a subsidiary of the UN. And there are things that the globalists do not like. They don't like constitutions and charters. They don't like the conflicting statutory frameworks around um, bioterrorism, war crimes, genocide, torture. They don't like any of that stuff. They don't like when states and provinces and counties and like towns pass their own laws protecting informed consent, um, protecting people from 
for consumer safety. They actually put out a report in October 2022, state laws limiting public health protections hazardous for our health. And there's a whole bunch of things in there that states have started doing that the globalists do not like. So doing more of those things, more bringing control back to the state, more using Article 10 of the Constitution to reclaim state authority. Um, those are all extremely useful. And I do think it's going to break. I think there's going to be a tipping point and the, the criminal prosecutions are going to start. And we have all the evidence. And every time they try to answer what we're talking about by saying national security, they reinforce that this is the right way to go. This is what they're doing. They're doing war crimes. Very good.